Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode two of my series, The Mexican-American War, The Republic of Texas. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, Mexico had struggled to control Texas due to raids by the powerful Comanche and filibuster expeditions by American adventurers, so it had allowed Stephen Austin to establish a colony in 1823. Following Austin's lead, thousands of Americans immigrated to Texas, attracted by free land perfect for growing cotton, until the Mexican government banned American immigration. Tensions escalated until the colonists revolted and quickly captured the isolated Mexican garrisons. However, President Santa Ana arrived with an army much sooner than expected and slaughtered the garrisons of the Alamo and Goliad. The revolt appeared doomed, but Santa Ana rashly pressed forward without his main army and was captured at San Jacinto, where he agreed to free Texas. Unfortunately, the Texan application to join the Union was rejected, so the new Republic of Texas would have to navigate an uncertain future. After winning the first presidential election by a landslide, Sam Houston became president of the Republic of Texas on October 22, 1836. Recognizing that the new republic was still fragile, Houston attempted to unite the various factions by including his rivals in the new cabinet. Mirabel Lamar was made his vice president, and Stephen Austin became secretary of state. Honestly, Texas faced major challenges. The army of volunteers was restless, treaties were needed to make peace with the various tribes, and peace with Mexico needed to be settled. Also, the government was weighed down by massive debts. Unable to acquire foreign loans, the Texan government taxed imported goods, which simply increased smuggling. Unable to enforce customs duties, the government tried to tax property, but again was unable to actually enforce collection. Having failed to bring in any form of revenue, the government simply printed money, so its currency rapidly devalued. Unable to pay its staff, the government basically could not function. In particular, it could not process land claims, which was crucial if it wanted to attract immigrants to buy land. Despite the celebration of victory, independence was dangerous since the new nation no longer had the Mexican army to protect against Indian raids. And there were raids since Mexico had given the colonists land claimed by local tribes, especially the Comanche, who were based near the northern part of Texas. Fortunately, the Comanche were also tired of endless fighting and accepted a temporary peace. Unfortunately, Houston was succeeded as president by the dashing and extremely aggressive Mirabel Lamar on December 1st, 1838, and he immediately broke with Houston's policy of peace with the tribes. At least, foreign relations proceeded more smoothly. French merchants wanted access to Texan markets, while French spinners wanted Texan cotton, so France recognized Texas in 1839. However, relations with Britain proved more complex. Many older Texans had fought in the War of 1812, so they initially resisted British attempts to create a closer relationship, but the growing conflict with Mexico made Britain more attractive, especially since the United States appeared uninterested in annexation. Although France and the Netherlands had recognized Texas, they both refused to loan the new nation any money. So, President Lamar simply printed more money, causing the currency to devalue further. If cotton prices had continued to rise, the Texan economy would have prospered, but the Panic of 1837 eventually brought down the American cotton industry. Since three-quarters of Texan cotton went to the United States, cotton prices began to fall in 1839. Making matters worse, Lamar had bankrupted the government by building a navy to raid Mexico, expanding the government, and then moving the capital to the western border, which was then called Austin, even though it was far from the settled areas. As I said, peace with the Comanche was possible, at least until their chiefs were taken hostage on March 19, 1840. Unsurprisingly, they attempted to escape, and the following shootout resulted in the deaths of 12 chiefs. The council house fight enraged all Comanche, sparking a series of bloody raids and reprisal raids. 
Despite the growing conflict with the Comanche and the increasing possibility of another war with Mexico, most Americans only knew that Texas was no longer part of Mexico, so immigrants streamed across the border in search of land to grow cotton. Why did many Americans want to leave their homes? Well, the Panic of 1837 had bankrupted farmers across the nation, so the promise of cheap land in Texas was extremely attractive. Also, the legalization of slavery lured immigrants from the southern states. As a result, the population of Texas tripled between 1837 and 1840. The first presidential term was only two years, then the terms were three years. Houston returned to the presidency in December 1841 and immediately ended Lamar's warlike policy. Negotiations with the Comanche were difficult, since they understandably had trouble trusting the Texans after the Council House fight, but the more agricultural tribes were convinced to sign treaties. Still, the New Republic's future was uncertain, which discouraged foreign investment, and the government's revenue was drained by the constant state of near war. Furthermore, the revolt had drawn many young men seeking adventure, and they spent much of their time drinking and gambling which did not foster economic stability. South Texas was lawless with Anglo and Mexican gangs roaming the region, raiding cattle and terrorizing small communities. To be fair, these were merely growing pains, but Texas grew too fast as streams of men who hoped for opportunity or a fresh start poured over the border. Unfortunately, many of these men had left to escape debts or wives or problems with the law, so they were not interested in the hard work of building a new nation. Texas would have been vulnerable to a Mexican invasion, except most of Mexico did not care about Texas, and there were enough internal issues to keep the Mexican government occupied until Santa Ana regained the presidency, and he cared about Texas a lot. Actually, Santa Ana's revolt was only one of several revolts that occurred around the same time in August 1841. Given his colossal failure during the Texan Revolution, it may seem strange that anyone listened to him, but he had restored his reputation when he suffered a near-fatal wound fighting the French several years earlier. Recognizing that none of them could win, the three rebel leaders established a temporary dictatorship to organize a new congress to write a new constitution and Santa Ana would serve as president. This time, he actually resisted the lure of his hacienda and stayed in the capital for months at a time. Santa Ana's government brought stability but lacked an effective tax collection system so the nation went further into debt. The new electoral college system limited suffrage to men with sizable earnings but it was still higher than the suffrage in Britain at the time. Moreover, the new government greatly increased the number of schools so the nation did improve during the period and it would have probably improved more but he launched a major raid on Texas in the spring of 1842. When a Mexican army occupied San Antonio for a couple of days in March 1842, it revealed two things. Mexico lacked the resources to feed and supply an army in remote Texas, and the Texan government lacked the resources to maintain an army that could defend the republic. Concerned about future raids, Houston ordered each county to raise militia, but he also called for volunteers from the United States. Aware that the government could not pay them, he implied that they could loot. The recompense tendered to our friends will be the property captured by them and the soil that they conquer. The call was answered and every steamboat from New Orleans brought armed volunteers. Overdependence on a single crop meant that Texas was vulnerable when powerful storms destroyed much of the cotton crop in the fall of 1842. The cotton that survived was hard to transport because the harsh weather had wrecked the Republic's already poor transportation network. The cotton bales that reached New Orleans sold for half of what they did in 1836 because the market had crashed. Even if farmers would have agreed to grow a different type of crop, they lacked the skills and the resources. Worse, a Mexican army captured San Antonio on September 11th and held it for nine days before returning to Mexico. Since militia had gathered to repel what was mistakenly thought to be a full invasion, Houston faced huge pressure to invade Mexico in retaliation. In fact, 
Ed Burleson, a Brigadier General in the regular Army and Houston's Vice President, was calling for volunteers to follow him into Mexico. Unwilling to see a rival gain credit, Houston gave command to Militia General Alexander Somerville and told him to make his own decision about whether or not to move south, thus avoiding any responsibility. Somerville was extremely indecisive and incompetent, but after several weeks of rain, the force of 700 militia and volunteers finally reached Laredo on December 8th. Since the town had been abandoned, Somerville announced that anyone who wanted to return home could, an offer that was accepted by nearly 200 men, mostly conscripted militia. The remainder crossed the Rio Grande, but by December 19th, Somerville and much of the army were fed up with the cold rain, so he decided to head back. Five captains refused, so Somerville led 189 men home. Captain William Fisher was chosen as commander of the remaining 300 men. Fisher planned to seize the town of Mier and ignored warnings from scouts that a Mexican force of 1,500 men was coming. Fisher rashly attacked on Christmas Day and was forced to surrender the following day. The prisoners were told to pick a bean from a jar where one-tenth of the beans were black and the 17 who chose black were executed. More died in prison before the survivors were released in September 1844. The executions and the mistreatment produced a fury among Texans rivaled only by the Alamo and Goliad. Britain promised to ensure Texan independence in exchange for a promise to end slavery, but never actually accomplished anything, even though it was the largest holder of Mexican debt and Mexico nearly defaulted on its loans in 1842. Britain also refused France's offer to jointly pressure Mexico to acknowledge Texan independence. Tired of broken British promises, many Texans began to suspect that Britain was working with Mexico to reconquer Texas. To be fair, the suspicion seemed reasonable since many British leaders publicly admitted their desire to see Texas end its slave trade, including Charles Eliot, the actual British diplomatic representative in Texas. At the same time, it is bizarre that any observer would think that Texan planters would give up their slaves, especially since there was no abolitionist faction in Texas, and planters openly stated that they had left the United States to escape criticism from northern abolitionists. Most important, cotton was the path to wealth, and only slaves could be forced to grow cotton, so Texas depended on slavery. The British seemed to want Texas to remain independent and thus dependent on trade with Britain while blocking American expansion south. Independence depended on British support, which had too high a price, so Houston made a renewed push for annexation by the United States in the spring of 1843. The key question is, could Texas have survived as an independent republic? The population of Texas had boomed to nearly 200,000 people by 1846, although 45,000 were slaves. While the majority of immigrants naturally came from the United States, Houston had signed colonization contracts with immigration societies in England, Ireland, France, and the German states, which had paid off. Henri Castro, a French impresario, brought in over 2,000 French people between 1843 and 1847. However, French immigration paled in comparison with German immigration. At least 15,000 Germans had settled in Texas by 1846, building small German communities and towns. In addition, Czechs, Serbs, Silesians, Poles, English, and Norwegians settled in Texas, arriving either as families or as men hoping to bring over their families, so they came to build, unlike the initial wave of adventure-seeking young men from the southern states. Given the large number of European immigrants, the desire for annexation would have likely declined. Still, while Texas was maturing, most of it remained dangerous frontier, subject to raids by the Comanche or the Apache, and Houston, the capital, was filled with saloons, dance halls, gambling dens, and frequent murders. Despite the obstacles, Houston and Lamar had led Texas to become a member of the world community. In 1843, 24 nations had consular offices in Galveston and 69 foreign steamship companies had offices there. Still, Houston would accept annexation if the United States agreed to pay off the Texan public debt, guaranteed slavery, and 
protected it from Mexico. Meanwhile, although the border raids often favored Mexico, even Santa Ana had accepted that they could not reconquer Texas. Worse, even if Mexico did retake Texas, it would likely mean war with an expansionist United States. Aware of the need for allies, he tried to negotiate a treaty with France and Britain where Mexico would recognize Texan independence if they pledged to support Mexico if the United States annexed Texas. It was unlikely that they would sign, but he became distracted by the death of his wife and then his marriage several days later to the 15-year-old daughter of a wealthy family. Although probably unrelated, Santa Ana's key cabinet ministers broke with him around the same time. The cause appears to have been Santa Ana's return to his habit of spending more time at his hacienda than in the capital when they needed his influence to achieve their policy goals. The remaining ministers could not cope with the growing discontent, and several generals led revolts against him. Recognizing that he lacked real support, he attempted to return to Veracruz, but was captured. After five months of captivity, the new government decided to simply let Santa Ana go into exile and gave his supporters amnesty. José Joaquín de Herrera became president on December 6, 1844. While Santa Ana had wanted to retake Texas to avenge his humiliation, Herrera had no attachment to Texas and debated recognizing the independence of Texas. If Herrera's moderate government had been able to resolve some of the other problems facing Mexico, the decision to accept the loss of Texas might have been less controversial, but it proved ineffective and the opposition rallied patriotic support against the government. Still, the United States had failed to annex Texas for over eight years. So Herrera probably had time, unless something dramatic changed in the United States. To sum up, the United States had refused to annex Texas, so it became the Republic of Texas. Despite raids by the powerful Comanche and the threat of invasion from Mexico after Santa Ana regained the presidency, the Republic began to prosper due to increased immigration and a profitable cotton industry. Moreover, Santa Ana was replaced as president by Jose Herrera, who wanted a peaceful solution to the situation. President Sam Houston still hoped to arrange annexation by the United States, but the American government did not appear to be interested. Until the situation in the United States changed dramatically, which I will explain next episode. Thanks for listening.